Joining us now for some analysis is retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell. Um, Sean, let's talk about these cluster munitions. Exactly. Why are they so controversial? Yeah, they've been around for a long time, and these grey hairs are testimony to the <laughs> fact that they used to be a central pillar of our military capability. They weren't controversial at all. Um, but that was the time before we had precision weapons that could actually seek out and strike targets accurately. Uh, so in the day, the only way to hit targets, particularly mobile targets like tanks, was to have an area weapon where you looked, uh, fired lots and lots of bomblets around it. Some would hit, some would miss. Um, the challenge with those weapons, though, is that not all... And we've seen one of them here, um, is that there's a lot of ordnance inside, but not all of the little bomblets go off when they hit the ground. And that leaves some unexploded ordnance around, uh, up to 10%, in fact, more than that for some of the Russian weapons. Now, the challenge, though, those bomblets are unexploded bombs. They uh, stay on the ground for literally decades. And the biggest casualties from these weapons, over 98%, is actually civilian casualties after the event, and over half of those are children. As a result of that, now that we've got uh, precision weapons, over 120 nations have actually banned the use of these, including the UK, but Russia, America, America and Ukraine are not signatories to that agreement. It's interesting you say that now we have precision weapons, we're not using them. What was the reason that we decided not to use them? Was it that we have precision weapons or was it that they're so dangerous that 98% of the casualties from these are from uh, civilians? Like a lot of these things, it's not a binary choice. Um, over the years, the West has invested a huge amount of money in precision weapons, and that's been the asymmetric advantage that we've been applying to Ukraine, is giving precision weapons. So it means that big bombs, you can actually have them much smaller, because if you're going to hit the target, you can tailor the effect, and you don't have all the collateral damage. Back in the day, we had no, no way of doing that, and therefore the only way to guarantee striking targets was a football pitch size of bomblets, and you could guarantee to be on the line of a tank, you wouldn't be able to hit it directly on, but you would guarantee with a whole you've load used of them, bomblets. Right? Just yeah, to say, you've not, used not, them. Not, in, um, not in war, but certainly we've uh, used them on training ranges, and they're remarkably effective at, uh, at hitting tanks, particularly. They were at the, in the Cold War, they were a central pillar of the Harrier Forces weapon, and we, we used to plan to be using them all the time. So overnight, they didn't suddenly become dreadful weapons. I mean, there is an argument that says any weapon is dreadful, um, but actually, if you compare the dud rates, the amount of ordnance that gets left unexploded, mines create 10 times more deaths uh, annually around the world than these do. It doesn't mean they're not dangerous, but I think the context is the American weapons are significantly more effective. Um, the Americans have been arguing there's a 2.35% dud rate, I think. That still sounds a lot, but if you look at some of the uh, Russian weapons that are being used in uh, Ukraine at the moment, they're up to 40%. So literally, nearly half the bomblets don't go off, so they leave a carnage around. But any dud rate is going to leave a legacy. The point being is that if Ukraine is going to use them, they're going to use them on their own soil, so they own that risk. And if they use them on minefields, trying to clear big trenches of minefields, after the war, they're going to have to clear all these mines anyway. So clearing the ground of unexploded ordnance as well as the mines can be done together. And just finally, the Russians have been using these. In Kharkiv, for example, yes. Ukrainians, the UN says they have, they say, say they haven't. But when you're, when you're in the middle of a battle and you're looking at what to deploy where, when you're looking at cluster munitions, what's happening in Ukraine, where do you think that they would use them? And why are they saying yes? If you're going to send these, please, on behalf of Ukraine and the US saying, we're going to send you these. Yeah, one of the, the challenges, I think, is we are often commentating on this through the peacetime environment. We must remember that President Zelensky is fighting a war of national survival here, and he, you know, he cannot afford to lose. He's running short of weapons, and one of the challenges he's got on the spring offensive is he's facing established Russian trench systems and a huge minefield. He could use his troops, his infantry, to gradually take those out, be highly costly, highly attritional, and also take time. If you use something like a cluster weapon, it could blow a path through the minefield if you used enough of these things and therefore allow his tanks and heavy weapons to get through and potentially create a breakthrough and bring the war to a much earlier end. And that is why, I think, this very controversial mm. issue... But, frankly, President Zelensky has got a choice between making progress, loads of people are dying in this war anyway, moving it on and getting on the offence, but he owns the risk of these legacy unexploded bombs. So it's no great surprise that he's been asking for these weapons. And ultimately, President Biden was reluctant initially. It's been a difficult decision, but he has ultimately decided to go with it. OK. Sean, thank you so much.